that gets like taped into my bra from then on it in because they were like this damn necklace is ruining every shot hello everyone welcome back for a brand new episode of collider ladies night We've got one of the stars of Mortal Kombat with us this time around, which I'm mighty pumped for. It's Jessica McNamee. Hello, and how's everything going? Everything is good. It's good. I was uh, just saying that I'm finally learning how to speak again after it feels like being trapped in my house for a year after COVID. So you've got me at a good time, I think. Do you remember the first time you ever watched a movie or a show and you caught yourself thinking either, I could do that or I want to do that? Yes, it would have been, I think, Notting Hill, Julia Roberts. I don't think I could do that, but uh, I would like to be able to do that. I remember watching her and being like, oh, what a dream. She's such a dream boat and just what a great movie. And I was like, that would be a great kind of film that I would enjoy doing. I remember that. That is a solid choice right there. So with that in mind, when you first pictured yourself making it, so to speak, what did you picture? Was it kind of following in the footsteps of a Julia Roberts? Was it becoming maybe an action star? I mean, yeah, I'd like to double in all the above. I I love a good rom-com and I'm so glad they're having a resurrection, I feel like at the moment. Netflix are kind of doing some fun ones, but I was always really active growing up. I played a lot of sports and uh, I really, really like pushing the boundaries and uh, upping my adrenaline. So action star was definitely up there in, in roles that I was desperate to play. What sports did you play? Was was tennis on the list perhaps? Well, it actually wasn't. I, I, my parents tried to make me good at tennis. I think they were like, you know, we could... Uh, retire off her tennis career um (laughs) but it didn't work out I played really funny sports that you're not going to know because they're Australian well one in particular is called netball it's actually a commonwealth sport so people in the UK will know it Canada um but not in America and and believe me I've tried to find a mixed netball team here to play in and very far and few between but it's I can't even describe it it's like basketball but silly (laughs) piques my interest I did try Australian football before and that is that is a fascinating sport I cannot believe they bounce a ball shaped that way I know well AFL also known as Australian rules football is an amazing game I reckon that's my favorite game to watch I I don't blame you I went I went down the rabbit hole of watching just a million clips when I was trying it out and it is it's fascinating and the athleticism involved is just wild I know and they they're really hot (laughs) they're very good looking well well. that 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 encourages me to try it yet again exactly very good eye candy so going back to the earlier days of your career in particular auditioning because nothing fascinates me more than someone who puts themselves through that and is able to just stay focused and even when you're get, getting hit with disappointment, just still forging forward. So for the audition process earlier on, can you give me one high moment and then also one low moment and then maybe how you overcame it? Yeah. Um, well, a high moment, I think, well, this was one of them, um, but that's kind of a boring answer, but I'll give you another one. Uh, I, my first American project, a film called The Vow, that my friend Michael Susie directed with Rachel McAdams and Channing Tatum. I was in Australia. I had just been on a Australian TV show there and I just wrapped, I just finished that. And um, that came through and the, I put myself on tape from Australia and I got the role off tape and I was beside myself. I couldn't believe it. Um, I hadn't worked in America before. I didn't know. I mean, talk about imposter syndrome. I was like, what am I doing? Next thing I was just on a plane over here and shooting that movie. So that for me was like definitely one of the most pivotal moments. I mean, you know, that's how I ended up here essentially. And now I live in LA. So um, I have a lot of uh, gratitude for that job. Um, And then low points. Look, I've had a bunch. (laughs) It's a brutal industry, as everyone in this business knows. You know, there's roles that I've missed out on there. Um, I know I was in the mix for, oh, 
um, Invisible Man. My, but my beautiful friend Harriet Dyer got that. That was for, uh, for the sister role. And I was really disappointed about that, but my friend Harriet got it and she's so amazing and just such a beautiful person. So I was also very happy for her to get that one. I know that was a bummer. And then, you know, funnily enough, I got this, I think weeks later. So I don't think I could have done this had I done that, which is very interesting too. It was, it was meant to be because you kick ass in this movie and then she got one of the best kill sequences of oh the God. entire year. That's, that scene in a movie that I love from top to bottom is hands down Thank one of my favorite scenes. Insane, so. I know. Um, and she's just such a good actress. And she's so versatile as well. She plays like, the, she's amazing com a comedian. So she did a great job. So going from some of those early shows to your first feature film, which I absolutely loved. It's The Loved Ones, right? Yes. <laughs> Having had all of that TV experience, was there anything about the feature filmmaking process that surprised you when you hit that set? Oh, absolutely. I couldn't believe how slow <laughs> a film moves. You know, to film a movie, you have so much more time. And even on a small indie like that, I was like, what do you mean we get to, you know, have 10 goes at this scene, at, at this one take in uh, Home and Away, you get one if you're lucky. And um, I'm a bit dyslexic. So I, I sometimes struggle with dialogue <laughs> and I would often need more than one take, let me tell you. I love asking about this too, because there are so many unique techniques out there. What is, uh, what are the key things that you like to do in order to memorize dialogue and prepare for, a, for maybe a, an exposition heavy scene? Well, this has been a process for me because I did earlier on with dyslexia struggle with um, learning dialogue. And, uh, and so there's this great app called Line Learner that has saved my life. Basically, you just read your lines and the other person's lines in and you can then on the app mute the other person's lines so there's just a gap between your lines and their lines or whatever and you can just talk back to yourself. Oh, my God. I feel like that's probably very useful for, I don't know, for a variety of forms of public speaking too. Yeah, it is. And beta blockers. <laughs> They're awesome. They also work a treat. Going from the Australia entertainment industry to Hollywood, I know you were explaining how the vow came to be. What, but was there anything about that process that proved especially challenging or did the vow in particular make it kind of a seamless transition for you? Uh, it made it a lot easier. In fact, we shot that in Canada, which is very much, I would say, a happy medium between Australia and America. They're kind of American in a lot of ways, but they're part of the Commonwealth. So they've also got the Australian sensibility about them. So I kind of moved, I, I got there first and then headed over to America. So it was a nice, easy transition. All right. I'm taking a big leap forward now. Battle of the Sexes, a movie that I absolutely love and I'm still angry it didn't get any Oscar love that year. Mm. Is that the first time you played a real person in a movie? Yeah, it was. How, how does something like that change the game for you? It was interesting because there's a certain pressure that comes with playing someone that already lives, especially when they're still living. Um, but it was also interesting because there wasn't a ton of footage. And uh, in Australia, Margaret Court is widely known, but internationally I mean people know her name and particularly you know my parents generation but yeah it's not like she's so well known out there in people's eyes that there was like you know a magnifying glass over my performance going is she doing this role justice I think does that make sense yeah um it was very interesting though because uh it all came at a time where um Margaret Court who I was portraying kind of had come out and uh was saying some fairly uh kind of had some fairly strong opinions about things that I very heavily disagreed with being um marriage equality um and yeah she was kind of coming out very much against that at the time that the movie was coming out so that was really a weird time for me uh yeah having to portray a woman that I was not one bit agreeing with how how do you maybe block out some of the current events that were happening while you were actually shooting? Because this this happened while you were shooting, or when? No, it wasn't. It was interesting because uh, yeah, it was. It happened right after we shot. So 
it was I also was I was worried because she's not portrayed in the in the best light in the movie and um she is an Australian icon I mean there's a an arena Margaret Court arena that's named after her down in Melbourne where they play the Australian Open and uh you know she is she has been a well-loved figure in Australian sports so I was a bit panicked about the fact that she kind of was getting a bit of a bad rap in in her portrayal in the movie um but then she came out with these brash statements and uh she kind of shot herself in the foot so we actually she actually came off looking quite good in our version of the movie we could have gone a little harder I think in hindsight well as someone who is far removed from the reality of the situation you are so good in that role and you just completely lose yourself in it it took like I had seen a lot of your work and it took me like a good hot second to realize that that was you in the role and I I just can't imagine anything better especially when you're playing a real person yeah thanks the wig helped they wanted to give me that haircut in real life. I was like, ain't happening. No, sorry. I am not living with that hair. It's one of the things that I love asking in general is, you know, just the value of having a good scene partner who's giving you everything you need while you perform as well. So with the two of them, what is something unique they did for you as a scene partner on that movie that you really appreciated? I think both of them, it was um, playing tennis. You know, like we had doubles as well. I mean, none of us were pros when it came to that, but uh there are a lot of times that they would actually be on the other side of the net hitting balls, even though it was, you know, we weren't any of us that good. Actually, Steve was pretty good. Um, yeah, I would say that. But, I mean, they're both just such professional. I mean, they're so amazing, both of them. Uh, that, And, they look, they are huge stars and, and you, there was no difference from them and anyone else on set, that was kind of the best part. It was the way that they composed their composure and their uh, treatment of everyone was just wonderful. And, you know, you hear horror stories in this town about people being divas. And I'd say just watching them conduct themselves was probably the biggest, you know, lesson for me. I do, I do love hearing that, especially when it comes to people I admire like them. Yeah, same. So now going into The Meg, Yet another one. I love that book too. And that movie adaptation. You read the books? Oh, I haven't read all of them. I read the first one. And now I guess that means now we need a sequel so I could keep reading more. I know. I know. Well, they, they do uh, deviate from the books quite a lot. So I I'd be interested to see. I don't even know where they're going to go with the second one. They are talking a sequel, but I, you know, there's so there's, I, like I said, the first one deviates so much from the book. So they could go in a whole different direction. We're not really sure. Yeah, I feel like I like I vaguely remember it maybe having a working title of Meg the Trench or, or something. And I know there was a director attached to it. Ben Wheatley. Wasn't it Ben Wheatley? Yeah, I don't know where they're at with it, to be honest. There was all, yeah, there was all this buzz about it and then COVID and then uh, yeah. Mortal Kombat. So I have not even, I'm not even across that. I probably should be. Ooh. That the pandemic definitely derailed things, but that's one project that I hope gets back on track. So does that mean that you'll get to continue on with that character should that movie actually happen? Yeah, I don't even know. I'm not across it. I should be. I'm a terrible person. I mean, that would be the dream. I would love to be involved. I had such a blast filming that movie. And, um, you know, Jason's great. And uh, the whole process was so fun. We got to shoot in New Zealand. I also heard that they're potentially shooting it in Australia, which would be amazing it's the only way i can get back into the damn country at this point wait do you just say you can't get back into the country it's just hard at the moment there's um two-week quarantine and um gotcha. flights are very few and far between because there's no traveling allowed there at the moment so yeah i gotta get a job to get me back there we're, we're getting there. We're taking baby steps. I've, <laughs> I've found more hope lately than ever. So I think you're going to get back there soon. I and so. I wouldn't mind if it's for the Meg too. I do want the entire ensemble to come back because I, f I feel like the ensemble and the chemistry between all of you is part of the reason that that movie was very special. But one of my favorite sequences in the movie is your introductory sequence, which is, you know, quite the action sequence there. So of everything that it took to make something like that happen, I guess the, the significant green screen and effects, mm -hmm. shooting that sequence in a confined space, the stabbing incident, like what was the most difficult thing of that entire sequence? That was, but for me, it was learning all of the like technical submarine, like boop, 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 boop. I had to like, you know, I can't even, I don't even remember it now. It was like, oh, and where, the thermocline and the, and the blah, blah, blah. I couldn't remember it. 
I was just couldn't remember it. And I was sitting in there and it was also choreographed a lot of that too. Cause I was, you know, having to zip and zap all of this technology and I'm technologically illiterate at the best of times. So I was like, you're like trying to get me to operate a submarine. You've got the wrong gal, <laughs> but we got there in the end. Would you learn how to pilot a sub? I spent 10 years with a certain whale saving environmental group that shall remain unnamed for legal reasons. Yeah, ask her if she ever blew up a whaling ship with a homemade torpedo. Hey. No. So you go from making the Meg with a really seasoned, you know, big budget act, uh, action adventure director like John Turtletaub. Then you go over to Mortal Kombat, which has a first time feature director. So when you sign on for this movie, what is it about Simon that makes you say, you know, it's his first time, but I think he's got this. Yeah, well, so many things. He is... Um just one of the kindest people really, and really calm and together. And when I, I got on Skype with him um, after I he'd seen my self tape and I just had a feeling that he, I just had every confidence in him by the way he presented himself. And the other thing he did was he um, had already the, the orchestral Mortal Kombat theme song that you hear in, in the movie that was already composed and um, he played that to me in our Zoom call, in our um, Skype call. That's how long it feels, how long ago it feels because it was Skype, it was before <laughs> Zoom was even a thing. And then meanwhile, that's only like a year and a half ago. Um, and I heard this song and it, music is like, I mean, I'm, I'm such a music fan and it's such a way to my heart as well. So he played me that and I was like, oh, that's amazing. I had all the feels. Um, but yeah, he, he, I can't say enough great things about the guy. He's just such a good dude. And then, and, and then being on set with him as well, you wouldn't even tell. I mean, and it's not, he's not a first time director in the, in the sense that he's directed some unbelievable things, um, amazing commercials and worked with so, some of the best sportsmen in the, in the game. So um, he's been under intense pressure in his career. And, and this was a high pressure film. You know, there's a lot of pressure from the fans, from um, the studio, I'm sure. A lot of, um, a lot of cooks in that kitchen. And, uh, you know, we were all so all fighting um, to give out the best performances possible. And, uh, you know, that meant at times fighting for um, life, not, not against each other, but for ourselves, you know, fighting, fighting to find our voices. And uh, he just managed it with such grace. I never saw the guy ever lose his temper. It was amazing. He just was always so cool, calm and collected. Like no matter the, the set size that is of the utmost importance, is there an example of, you know, a quality of the character or a line of dialogue that you had to fight for that you felt was important to be in the film that we well, can see now? I shouldn't say fight because the great thing about Simon uh, McCoy is that he let us play constantly. So even if I wanted this to say, whether it be a line or a look or whatever it was, he would always say yes. There was never any, I know better. He would go, yeah, let's give it a go. And then it was whatever kind of looked best at the end of the day. So no, there was nothing I had to fight for. I could ask, could I try this? Or I'd just try it. And he would be like, great, or let's try something else. When you first sign on for this movie, to play this character, what is the very first thing you do? Because you already referenced the pressure with a project like this. There's a lot of intense fans out there. So do you play the games? Do you maybe look at Bridget Wilson's work in the 95 movie? What's what's the first thing you do when you want to play Sonia? I got on the old interweb, this thing called Google. Um, <laughs> I actually just Googled Sonia Blade. I did all of this reading. I went into the fandom. I mean, it is endless. And then I found it really helpful for me um, to watch YouTubes of people playing the game. And uh, I got a real eye for what was going on and I learned more about the world. Uh, but I didn't specifically deep dive into Sonya. I did, I did, but like the whole world. I needed to catch up on the whole world of Mortal Kombat. I, I was a Mario Kart um, pro, not so much a Mortal Kombat pro growing up. So um, yeah, there was a lot to learn. 
If it's not Mortal Kombat, I respect the fact that it was Mario Kart. <laughs> well, there you go. I could play Princess Peach pretty well, I think. A big question I have for you that we kind of already touched on is the idea of doing heavy lifting when so much exposition is on your shoulders. And you have one scene in this movie where it's basically all on you to explain Mortal Kombat. So for anyone else out there who might find themselves in a similar situation and they want to make sure they deliver that important information clearly, but also naturally and in an engaging way, what is the the one big tip you would give them? Know your dialogue. That was hard. But I will say that was also the audition scene. So I had had a really good practice at that and I was pedantic about my audition. I self-taped for it three times, three different um, times with people. I was shooting another film in Australia at the time and I was dragging cast members in like weekly to retape because I was like, no, nope, that won't do. I'd be calling my agents, don't send that one. I've got a better, I've got a better one in me. So I had practiced that for what feels like an eternity. Um, so by the time we got on set, I knew it pretty well. The tricky thing was I knew it so well that when they were like, actually, I think maybe we need to add this line in because that makes sense with this part. I was like, oh no, <laughs> I need to re-unlearn this scene that I'd learned so well for my audition. But it was tricky. I'm not going to lie. I really, str- I really, really found that tricky to uh, get on there and, and, uh, and nail. Um, so they were patient with me. <laughs> you pull it off quite well. I was very impressed with that scene. So we're going to put the spoiler warning up now. So feel free to talk about whatever you want and everyone will know. Don't watch this part until you watch Mortal Kombat. And then you could press pause and replay the video and it starts right here. It's that right. easy. What right. was the main motivator for you while playing Sonya in regards to why she wanted the mark so badly is there is there any backstory to that and a specific thing driving her or is it more just her urgency to save be a part of saving the world I think it's two I think there's two parts to that yes she's such a do-gooder and she's obviously special forces and her whole mission in life is to fight for the greater good so um definitely to save earth clearly duh and then the other thing is there is the backstory of um, Jax and also um, like she speaks about in that exposition scene is that, you know, she, she's seen this happen before and she, it's wiped out her whole, her whole team. Um, and so she wants revenge, I think. I don't want to get greedy, but I want a Sonia prequel where we could see her piecing all of that together. That'd be great. I know. I mean, that's the great thing about this is there could be, you know, we don't know. Who knows? The, the possibilities are really endless here. One tiny little detail that I'm curious if you have more information on, because there's one shot that focuses on it pretty heavily. It's, it's when you're grabbing the necklace in the house. Does that mm-hmm. necklace have a specific meaning? Because I don't think we see that again. No, it's <laughs> continuity. <laughs> no I mean sure let's let's say it does but no I think it had fallen out in the previous scene and so she has to tuck it in (laughs) that's continuity that's great answer sorry whoever your script supervisor was gets uh gets an a plus for for making sure a tiny detail like that is managed that gets like taped into my bra from then on it in because they were like this damn necklace is ruining every shot that is that's a mighty fun fact here here's a big broad one for you but i wanted to put it in the spoiler section so you could talk about whatever you wanted what would you say is the wildest stunt of the bunch in the entire production for you Oh, for me? Oh, for sure. The um, reptile fight. I mean, oh, I have two. I have a couple. The reptile fight was insane for me. Um, that was a process learning that knife catch to then stab reptile. I was, they weren't even going to let me do it to begin with, but I had to learn this like sideways, backwards cartwheel flip thing on a wire. And I, it looked a lot easier than it was. Um but I told them that I really, really wanted to learn that stunt. And I really wanted to learn, I, I wanted to get on the wire. I was like, I've got, a, there's a whole team of people here that can teach me wire work. So like, let's do this. And um, I had some time in the lead up to shooting. I was out there for about six months, uh, six months, six weeks, learning uh, stunts and knife fighting and all of it. So I was like, let's do it. They let me, 
and it was about 30 takes on set in front of a burning wall and poor Josh was just hanging there in front of this burning wall literally his makeup melting off his face and I just kept going and going and going until finally I feel like I, I got it in the end we got there before we have to close out the Mortal Kombat portion of our conversation, we're gonna do some quick superlatives, like high school superlatives, but movie themed. So let's start with let's start with class clown, but switch it to set clown. Who's who's the one that's cracking jokes on set the most often? Josh. Most athletic, or maybe in this case, let's say fastest fights, fastest fight moves. Oh, Joe Taslim. He's so good. Ridiculous. This was a weird thing that I didn't realize was still a high school superlative until I looked it up. But what about most changed? I would say Max. Max was uh, shy at first, I think, and quite like Insula. And he's a real class clown now. Who is the most like their character? That's not really a superlative, but let's throw it in there. Ludi, Ludi for sure. <laughs> I could very much see that who is the biggest mortal combat nerd of the bunch like if you wanted some source material info who are you turning to joe. joe as well we have hit the end of ladies night that is our random question section so it's just whatever comes to my mind in the moment let's go with if you had the opportunity to join any film franchise out there what franchise would you pick and why i would like to be in deadpool I would be happy to see that. I think you need a place in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. I'll vote for that right now. I'm like, I'm scared to say, I don't know. I'm so bad at these universes. I like watch the movies, but I'm like, I can't tell if that's DC or whatever <laughs> else it's meant to be. What is there, Marvel? I don't know. I'm gonna, I'm, this means I'm never going to get a job in any of these because I'm terrible when it comes to knowing who is in which. It's very much not true. You focused on a good one in Deadpool. That's a that's a fun film series there. And now it's part of the MCU. So that's a, a pretty good one to jump into. Maybe one day. Maybe one day. Let's go with have you kept any just super cool costumes or props from any shows or films you've worked on? Yeah, I got to keep my shoes in um in uh Battle of the Sexes. They were those cool old school Adidas. Um the shoes that were actually, it was funnily enough, they were actually in fashion at the time we were shooting that movie. So they were easy to find, but I got to keep my shoes. And then I kept my necklace, funnily enough, from Mortal Kombat, the, yes. the, neck, the, the necklace in question. I don't even know if I meant to tell anyone that I, <laughs> I oh, I accidentally wore that one home. <laughs> oh, and I cut my gloves too. That was oh, purely cool. because I was getting calluses from working out. And I wanted actual workout gloves, so I've got them and I do wear them sometimes when I lift very, very light weights that I've not been actually lifting during quarantine. You deserve some time off. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Let's go with our very last ladies night question. It's the same question every episode. You could take it in a lighter direction or go deeper with it if you prefer. What is the biggest fear that you've ever had that you've actually managed to overcome? Swimming in the ocean, out deep dive, like out deep, deep in the ocean. Um, I'm scared of sharks and uh, I've, I've jumped in and I've ripped the bandaid off. I mean, I wasn't swimming with sharks technically, but uh, I would say that I get really scared of the unknown deep ocean. So shooting the Meg was interesting for me. <laughs> now I'm cu curious, was there any hesitancy to signing on to that movie because of no, that? No, because it was fake as hell I was like I'm not even gonna I didn't even see that damn shark until I saw it in the cinema I was like oh there it is I feel like that's the way to get over a big fear like that just make <laughs> a, a movie with a giant CGI whatever you're afraid of and then fear cured exactly no I'm usually up for the challenge like I like I like I like that adrenaline rush of like heights or jumping out of a plane I like those but when it comes to like oh under the water and something touches your foot like no deal forget about it very understandable i'm glad to hear the meg has paved the way to you overcoming that fear i gotta let you go now you got a lot of stuff to do you got a big movie to promote to everybody out there who has not seen mortal Kombat yet it is available in theaters and on hbo max on april 23rd do check it out and check out all the titles we highlighted on this edition of collider ladies night and also you're into the dark episode too oh yeah good one oh, i forgot that yes go see. too many things to talk about not enough time <laughs> Jessica, thank you so much for hanging out with us. I appreciate it and congrats on Mortal Kombat. Thank you so much. What a fun time. Thank you.